Hello, in this podcast, we're going to be learning about how matter cycles in ecosystems. Our learning objective is to describe how matter flows in the following cycles, water, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, and phosphorus. We'll start off by looking at the ecopod. Here's something that you may find interesting. Look closely. This is called an ecopod. You notice there's a shrimp swimming around in there. There are actually three of them. If you look See, right over here, you may notice a little plant coming off of this dead coral. There's plenty of microscopic plants in there. Most of the visible stuff disappeared. This is sealed shut. I've never opened it in over the two years I've had it because I cannot open it. If I do open it, then I sort of destroy it. So these shrimp have been living inside of here for over two years. No substance. Nothing can get in. Nothing can get out. Well, one thing actually can get in. That one thing is energy. Light comes in, and it provides the energy for photosynthesis of the plants in here, which are now mostly microscopic. The shrimp that are in here eat the plants. Their decomposers, the bacteria that will eat any of the dead algae, any of the dead decomposers, and also the waste from the shrimp. And also the shrimp, in addition to eating the plants, also eat the bacteria too. So it's a closed system. Everything cycles except for the energy. Now here are the main things to know about the ecopod. Light or energy is the sole thing to enter the ecopod. Everything else must be reused or cycled. And the same thing is occurring here on, on this earth, like an oxygen molecule in your lungs, once once in Abraham Lincoln's lungs as well as T-Rex's. And the water that you drink has been drunk and peed countless times by countless people and animals. The shrimp in that ecopod live for about five years, which is, I think, a little bit more than average. And about a year ago, the last of the shrimp died. First one died, and then two died within a couple weeks of each other. And this is what it looks like now. So the ecosystem is still going fine. It just happens that there's no shrimp in there. And since there's no shrimp, uh, the stuff that they're eating, like the algae, has grown quite a bit more. So you can see that on the dead coral, you've got branches of algae growing. So the ecosystem is still going, uh, and it's been going for all of these years. Shrimp don't live forever, and they die, but the ecosystem is still going. Here are some general terms that you need to know for this part of the unit. A lot of these terms are going to run in throughout the year. Abiotic factor is a non-living factor. For example, weather, like how hot it is, how, how much precipitation there is. Those things all affect ecosystems, but they're abiotic because these are not living things. Biotic factors are living factors. The example I have here is predation, how a, pre how a predator affects the population of its prey. That is a living fact that's affecting the ecosystem. Biogeochemical or nutrient cycles, and that's, that's basically what this whole podcast is about. These are elements that make nutrient cycles through living and non-living elements of ecosystems. An example of a living element is that when you eat an apple, the carbon that's in that apple is then transferred from an apple tree to you. Saying that you are what you eat is sort of true because everything that you are was once something that you ate. An example of element going from living to non-living would be when you exhale carbon dioxide, the carbon that was once a part of you has been transferred to the atmosphere. An example of non-living to non-living would be carbon dioxide in the atmosphere it can dissolve in the lake. It will, that will change the pH of the lake, make it more acidic because it turns into carbonic acid. And an example of non-living to living would be through photosynthesis, a plant turns carbon dioxide into sugar. Now a reservoir is a temporary storage site for an element. Elements may stay there for centuries. For example, there's some trees in Alley Pond Park which are older than the United States. So some of the carbon they took in, taken in from the photosynthesis back when this was the colony of New York instead of the state of New York are still there in that tree. Or elements can stay in a reservoir for hundreds of millions of years. And an example of that would be limestone. And limestone is pretty much made up of fossils like fossilized shells, fossilized corals. Or it could be uh, carbonates that precipitated out of the ocean or sea. Now the water cycle, we're not going to be spending uh, much time at all on in this podcast because this is something that you've learned again and again starting elementary school. You do need to know everything that's in this diagram here. One thing I'm going to emphasize because it's not something 
that you hit in elementary school and junior high, but we, you did get into it when you were taking biology or the living environment, and that is transpiration. On the bottom of leaves, there are things called stomata, and they are closable air holes. They allow gas exchange. It's through those stomates or through the stomata that carbon dioxide and oxygen will enter or leave the leaf. And also water will evaporate through that. That can sometimes have profound effects in the ecosystem, uh, particularly in places like rainforests, where the transpiration from all those trees literally creates the weather. A lot of the rain in a rainstorm that falls in a rainforest came up from the plants themselves. And one reason why some of the glaciers in the equatorial mountains are basically disappearing, like Mount Kilimanjaro, is because deforestation is cutting down the transpiration, and that's cutting down on the snowfall rates that are up on the top of the mountains, and the glaciers are disappearing. Some important things that you need to know about the water cycle. The freshwater reservoirs are glaciers and groundwater, and the glaciers are threatened by climate change. The groundwater is threatened by overuse, and we'll be getting into these things uh, later in other vodcasts. Two-thirds of the surface of this planet is covered by water, but only 0.024% of that water is available for our use, and of course we must share that with the ecosystems. Now the ways we alter the water cycle is we could be withdrawing water faster than it can be replenished. Uh, for example, the Colorado River is used for drinking water, it's used for agriculture, and it's also used by the ecosystems themselves. But so much of that water is withdrawn that usually the river runs dry before it reaches the Gulf of California. Another way we alter the water cycle is we clear vegetation. It could be to make a shopping mall, to make a parking lot, to make a city, or it could be to make a farm. We clear vegetation, which increases runoff, and that reduces transpiration since plants that were there aren't there anymore. Uh, we drain wetlands, and that can increase the flooding because wetlands are a place for water just to stop for a little while to hold it uh, so that the water isn't all released at once. Or in the case of the coastal wetlands, they can stop the flooding from things like nor'easters or from hurricanes. By the way, our school is on a drained wet. Next is the carbon cycle, which I know you've been somewhat familiar with, and you need to know everything in this diagram. Basically, autotrophs, which are basically plants, uh, they turn carbon dioxide into organic carbon through photosynthesis. Heterotrophs then get their carbon through their food. All organisms turn organic carbon into CO2 through respiration. When an organism dies, if it doesn't decay, it may fossilize, then leave the cycle because it's entered a reservoir. Burning fossil fuels takes the carbon out of the reservoir where it's been for millions or hundreds of millions of years and returns it to the atmosphere and into the carbon cycle. Important things to know. The reservoirs are rocks like coal and limestone. The oceans, where a lot of carbon dioxide dissolves into it, and also trees, as we covered the trees before. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, we have been removing carbon from rocks by burning fossil fuels and also clearing trees, which is called deforestation. Clearing the trees does two things. When the trees are burnt they add or decay, they add the carbon back to the atmosphere. And also, because the trees aren't there anymore, they're not photosynthesizing and removing carbon from the atmosphere. Impacts. Climate change. By carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Also methane, which can also be produced too, is a very strong greenhouse gas, and that will change the climate and make it a warmer place and change the amount of precipitation. And also ocean acidification. As more carbon dioxide dissolves in the oceans, it makes the oceans more acidic, and that can cause extremely harmful effects in places such as coral reefs, because the acid has a acid-base reaction with shells. And we'll go into these things later in another podcast. Next is the nitrogen cycle. This is probably covered a little bit in high school biology. Uh, we're going to get into a lot more here. Nitrogen is important for organisms because it's part of the, it's an essential part of proteins and an essential part of DNA. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, but it's N2. N2, we do not use it. We breathe it in, we breathe it out. It goes in through the plant stomata, it goes out from the, through the plant stomata. It's unusable. So what has to be done is something called nitrogen fixation. What that does it is it converts N2 into a usable form, usually ammonia or ammonium, which is NH4+, or nitrates, which is NO3-. And the nitrogen fixation is done by soil bacteria 
It could be done or by soil bacteria in the root nodules of certain plants, such as legumes like peas. And in the ocean and, uh, and aquatic systems, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, do it. And we do it artificially through something called the Haber process, which you should have learned in chemistry. Of course, you need to know the diagram for the nitrogen cycle as well as all the others. Now, nitrification is the conversion of ammonia, which is plant pea, among other things, into nitrates. Ammonification, decomposing bacteria break down complex nitrogen compounds into ammonia. And denitrification, that's bacteria in places like the wetlands and the lake bottoms, they convert NH3 into N2 and nitrous oxide, which is N2O. And that completes the cycle by, by returning the nitrogen from being usable as living things back to N2 which is atmospheric nitrogen. Human interventions in the nitrogen cycle. We add nitric oxides into the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels. The X stands for different amounts of oxygen because there, there's more than one kind of nitrous oxide. And the nitrous oxides become nitric acid in the clouds, and then they fall as acid precipitation. I said acid precipitation instead of acid rain because there's acid snow, there's acid fog, there's acid sleet, and so on. And we learn about the effects of acid precipitation later on in the year. And the bacteria that eat our livestock's waste and also our fertilizer produce N2O, and that is a greenhouse gas. Habitat destruction releases nitrogen to the atmosphere. Fertilizer and waste that is washed into aquatic and marine systems produce dead zones. We'll cover the dead zones when we get into the phosphorus cycle. Harvesting plants and irrigation removes the nitrogen from the soil. Like there's a certain amount of nitrogen that's in the soil and it goes into the plant. And then when you harvest and remove the plant, it doesn't decay or when it's eaten and then eaten by you, it's not going back into the soil and the farm where it came from. So that nitrogen has been removed from the, from the farm. This is replaced by adding fertilizer or through crop rotation or something else then the farm becomes less and less productive. Next is the phosphorus cycle. One of the main things to remember about the phosphorus cycle, because I've seen quite a few questions about this on the test, is that phosphorus cycle is the only one of these cycles where you will not find the element in the atmosphere. Only way you could would be like if there's a dust storm or something like that. The reservoirs for the phosphorus cycle are rocks and ocean sediments. And phosphorus is a part of nucleic acids such as DNA, RNA, and ATP, and ADP. It's a limiting factor for algae and plants. Its effects are such that if you look on a lot of your soaps, a lot, like say for washing your clothes, it says that it, there are no phosphates in it. A very important thing to remember when it comes to exam, particularly the AP exam, is that when you ask you how to reduce phosphate pollution, do not write down to remove phosphates from detergents because in the United States, except for dishwash detergent, there are no phosphates, so that answer would be wrong because it's already been done. Here's the human impact for the phosphorus cycle and also the nitrogen cycle too, it's the same thing. It's called nutrient pollution. It can cause dead zones and we've got one pictured over here. What happens is that the algae will eat up the fertilizer, it could be, pho could be phosphates or it could be nitrates, and the algae is spread over the whole surface. The lack of light, because the light's all blocked by the algae, it kills aquatic plants that are a little bit deeper down. The algae have very short lives. They reproduce, they reproduce very quickly and they live for a short time. So within a brief amount of time, there will be a lot of dead algae there. The bacteria decomposers eat up the dead algae. And when they do that, they use up all the oxygen that's in the water and almost everything in that lake or in the sea. There's a huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where the Mississippi drains into it. So almost everything in there that needs oxygen dies. Probably no fish at all in that lake. Next is the sulfur cycle. Sulfur is a part of amino acids, and the reservoirs are rocks and ocean sediments. Some producer bacteria use sulfur compounds in oxygen, or some producer bacteria use sulfur compounds in, in ecosystems that do not have a lot of oxygen or do not have a lot of light. Like if you look in the diagram here, you see the H2S hydrogen sulfide coming out of the C4 vents. They find very productive ecosystems with chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. The producers are bacteria that are eating up the hydrogen sulfides, sustaining a very nice ecosystem. Also, the plankton in the oceans produce dimethyl sulfide, and those can be condensation nuclei for creating clouds. Human intervention in the phosphorus cycle. Sulfur dioxide is released into the atmosphere, where it reacts with the water, and it makes sulfuric acid. 
and that's part of acid precipitation. And we'll get into the effects of acid precipitation in another podcast later in the year. We release the sulfur dioxide to the atmosphere in the following ways. We burn high sulfur coal and oil, or it could be through refining high sulfur oil into something else like gasoline. Also, when ores are refined to make pure copper or pure lead or pure zinc, the process releases sulfur, as well as a lot of other dangerous things, and we'll see that later on in the year. Now we've reached our conclusion questions, and for every single one of the cycles that we've gone over, I want you to identify a reservoir in that cycle, explain why ecosystems need that element, and also describe how humans have altered the cycle. By the way, in preparation for exam questions and the AP exam questions, when it comes to free response question, where you see the word identify, that means you write at least one sentence. When you see explain or describe, that means write at least two sentences. That concludes this podcast, and I will see you in class tomorrow.